Right. <laughs> Hi. So are we live? Should we just We're wait live? a second to see if yeah. people want to join? Yes. yes. Hello, everybody. <laughs> okay. So we've been live for about 20 seconds. I'll just give it another few seconds just in case there's people hopping on. And then I'll say a nice hello. But hi, Sheena. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Sheena. <laughs> okay. So, so we're about 30 seconds into the live now. So I think we'll start. Are you okay with that, Sheena? Yes, okay. I'm fine. Okay. And I'll, I'll, say this, I'll say this now and I'll re reiterate it again. For anybody that's live, if you want your name appear to appear in the chat and not, not for it to just say Facebook user, just click on the link that Sheena posted at, um, at the start of the live and just let StreamYard, which is the same as Zoom, let them know that you're happy for them to use your name. It's a data protection thing. So, yeah, I can see people. Hi, Alice Chang, I can see you. Hi, Saba, great. Okay, so hello, everybody, lovely 11 Plus Journey members. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Sheena Aja, and I'm the author of the 11 Plus vocabulary novel series and their supporting workbooks, the Cadwaller the Quests. And you can see those behind me there. And we're going to use the the verbal skills workbook, the book with the blue triangle, just to access some comprehension today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with another Sheena, Sheena Chan. And Sheena is, <laughs> um, Sheena is the founder of um, Equality Tuition. Um, and I'd also want to say a huge thanks on mine and Sheena's behalf to Saba, who yeah. um, is the founder of the 11 Plus Journey Group. Um, Saba invited us to present this Facebook Live today. And the topic of the Facebook Live today is it's a marrying of comprehension and creative writing and how we can put the two together to best improve our skills there. And um, But Sheena's going to talk, Sheena's tutor, show, so she'll be talking more about that. Um, and I think probably Sheena can pop up the first slide now and we can explain yes, what yeah. our aims are. Oh, just go in there, go to, okay. All right, so let's just go back a little bit. Right, so welcome everybody. It's a real privilege to work with another fabulous Sheena here. Um, and one of the questions, well, certainly one of the points that I try to make with the children that come into, um, that have tuition with me, is the idea not to separate comprehension from creative writing as if they are poles apart. And to really understand that when you're reading your text and you're trying to get meaning from it, the skills that you are using, the skills that you are employing will actually help you with your writing. They're English language skills, they're language skills. And so we mustn't think of them as two very separate entities. Instead, when we begin to think of them as part of the same thing, we will gain in confidence because we'll understand, we're well, actually, we already know a lot of this stuff, okay? And so that's the idea that I try to just um, make children aware of, but practically really point out the individual skills and show them what kind of skills they use in that will help them in their writing. So, Sheena, if I go back to you and you talk us through what the aims of today are. Will do. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we'll just go to the next slide. So, so what we're aiming to do in this session is we're aiming to look at different types of texts and, and glean what we can, build a picture from what we know without getting scared of looking at words that we don't know. So we want to look at some vocabulary and the literary devices in a text and some techniques and, and to be able to learn and retrieve the right information to be able to enable us to do well in these comprehensions. And then we're also going to, like we said, marry the two together. And I will come in and talk about the literary devices in the text we see, the styles, yeah. and how we can involve that in, in and improve our own creative writing. Fantastic. So we, we, Sheena will talk about um, how to approach various different texts. So they'll probably, we'll probably cover a multiple choice, um, a standard answer and a factual text. And yes. we need to be able to, to, she's going to teach you how to look 
at the text to quickly glean knowledge to be able to answer questions, particularly with multiple choice and elimination things, and also to understand language features and then how we might be able to use those in our own writing. So that's what we hope you'll get from today's um, session. Okay. Thank you, Sheena. And um, the resources that we're going to be using, um, of course, Sheena's fabulous um, standalone 11 plus vocab book. So I think, Sheena, you've got it in the background there. It's the yes, Composition it's the, and Verbal Skills Workbook one. That one, the one with the blue yeah. triangle in the top right. And just to say, you, a lot of people ask me, Sheena, you don't need to have done anything with any of my other books to use that book. It's completely standalone. Yes. And um, it's one of the books that I have bought um, and I've used it with my own students. And so it's one of the resources that I've gone to today um, to look to see, well, how do we use it and how does that have a link? How is that going to help me overall with my English skills? So we'll be looking at that. Um, we've also got um, a Highgate School paper, which you can download from the school's website. So I know that when we're prepping, I, myself as a tutor, I use a whole plethora of resources from other tutors that other tutors have made themselves and from um, big publishing houses, so CGP and so on. So all the resources that parents can buy. And of course, we go to schools websites where they have examples of um, past paper samples and that parents can access as well free. Um, and a lot of tutors will have them listed on their websites as well sometimes, and you can go to different tutors' websites and be able to download them. So the Highgate School paper is one you can download yourself and go through. And then there's another Tiger's nonfiction text, which I just had in my library of um, comprehension passages that I'll share with students. Okay, so they're all there and they're in the public domain, so they're available for you to um, be able to share and use yourselves. So we'll just be going, to sh sh going through it to show in how we approach different types of text and the different types of questions that come with those texts. And the distinction as well between non-fiction um, non rather. So the Tigers one is really just about data. And sometimes children find that a little bit more difficult to access, a little bit trickier to see the picture and to understand what's going on. Um, when compared to a story and a narrative, because they are, you know, more familiar with the style of a story. You know, they're more able to predict and that's more familiar with to them, so they're far more confident. But when it comes to a non-fiction text, then sometimes that can throw them a little bit and they feel a little bit not confident about what they know. So it's just here to show you the kind of generic skills that you apply to any text. Okay? All right. So let's start. OK, so the first thing that I'm going to pull up is Sheena's Comprehension and Verbal Skills Workbook 1. And this will be, if you have it at home, you can turn to it. Um, this will be um, work, I think it's worksheet 4. Sheena, I think it's 4, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, so I'll go to it now um, and pull that up on the screen. It should say when we come when it comes up on the screen. Which yes, it is. yes, it will have it on it. So let's just go to it now. Okay, so I'm using the fabulous new, fabulous new Streamyard. Um, finding my way around it, me and Sheena. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what it can do about it yet. But stream is service, right? Okay, so. We can see, right, so is, is this clear to everybody, first of all? Let me just check that it's clear, or do I need to make this much bigger? I can see it fine, Sheena. Really um, clear? Okay. So do you okay. want me to go ahead and read up to line I'd 10? like you, yes, please. Okay. Right, okay, so I shall start then, okay? Mm -hmm. The museum exuded a quaint and parochial atmosphere, and although it was large and housed some unrivaled antiquities, its tired veneer needed investment and, modish, and modern refurbishment. The Gwalch gem bracelet lay in a low-key glass case, its resting place for many years. This innocent home was a perfect disguise for its dazzling supremacy. 
the power it granted its wearer recognised by only a rare few. To the average spectator, the bracelet passed as a pretty piece of gold and emerald jewellery. Nice, but nothing special or, indeed, priceless. Its real value and power deliberately concealed. The keepers engineered it this way, intending minimal attention to be drawn to their secret force. They shunned bulletproof glass and laser beam protection and purposely stowed the gem in an open, public place. There they could guard it and no one could wear it. Wow. <laughs> wow. So just hearing Sheena read it. Thank you for that, Sheena, because that really brought it to life for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really brought it to life for me. And for most people, when we're reading a story, it does take you away somewhere. And one of the things that I try to encourage the children to do is to read something and sometimes to hear themselves read it because it has a different kind of impact when you train your ears to listen to yourself. And just like how Sheena was able to read that with meaning, it's the same kind of skill we want to develop with the children to be able to read with meaning, with meaning to be able to read and understand when to pause. And so we come back to the skills of comprehension. What is it to read with meaning? So we are only able to really read something. So sometimes the children will read a piece and not get the gist of it. And how do we help with that? And so what I do with the children, with my own children and tutees, is that what we do is break it down into small chunks. So rather than trying to get them to tell me about everything, what's the story about, which can seem huge. You know, it's like reading a report and then as an adult, somebody saying, so what did it say? You don't know where to start. So if as parents, if you're supporting your child through a piece of comprehension, and even you might find it tricky, because sometimes some of the passages, if you are trying to navigate a classic text with your child, for instance, I see lots of discussions around classic text, can't, you know, how do we do this very hard? Break it down into smaller chunks. And so what we mean by that is perhaps go into the very first, the beginning of the paragraph, a few lines. Now, when we are when we move to the few lines. So the museum exuded to all the way refurbishment. So just the first two lines. We can see that in this workbook, there are words in bold fonts. And of course, we understand that because this has questions to it, that perhaps there is going to be some questions which contain these words. Now, the children will naturally stop at the words that they don't know. And they zoom in on those words and think, oh, I don't know what that means. And for a child who needs confidence building, they will then interpret that to themselves to mean that, oh, I don't know what's going on. I, I have no understanding just because of the words there that they don't know. And so what I always encourage the children with is the idea that you actually do know. You have enough vocabulary already to be able to understand what's going here or to be able to um, paint a picture already. And it is okay to use your simple vocabulary and explain what's going on there. That's fine and that's going to be good enough. So the vocabulary bit of comprehension we can come to, but it shouldn't stop you from getting an overall meaning of what's going on, it's okay. So if we were to look at the first few a couple of lines, and if, certainly if there are any children watching or any parents, join in in the comments and give us your contribution or your thoughts about any of the questions we ask. We'll gladly receive those. So the museum exuded. So if the first two lines, what I would say to my, to my tutees, my children, okay, don't worry about the words that you don't know. Just by using the words you do know in those sentences, what can we see? So comprehension is all about seeing the picture. And one of the reasons I was so happy to be asked to do this with Sheena is because I asked her as well as an author, I was intrigued to know well, what process, when you're putting together a piece of writing or a text like this, or a piece of writing that we use this extract to, to 
based questions on, how do you go about painting that picture? How do you go about putting the words together so that it conveys an image? How do you do that, Sheena? And it was really, I was very intrigued with the response. And perhaps, Sheena, that's something that you can share with the group now? Sure. Um, so uh, going back to your your point about looking at the, so, so for the clues that will help you understand in a text, I mean, the, obviously my my texts are very tricky because um, in the novels, obviously there's the dictionary on the page and they're, they're stuffed with vocabulary in order for children to be exposed to it. But going back to the first two lines there, and I will tie into what you just asked in a sec, um, you know, the words that I'm seeing are, um, it's a museum, it's large, it's got some funny things called antiquities, but it's tired and mm. it needs something. And what it needs is modern. So to me there, I'm thinking, hang on, it's a museum, it's tired, it's big, but it needs to be made more modern. So we can kind of take out all the hard stuff and we've got the picture there. So, you know, unless there's an antonym or synonym question that comes up for that first two lines, we know we're talking about a big old museum um, mm -hmm. that needs some money spending on it. That's so, right. <laughs> so, so, so from going back to your point, that's how we would choose, um, you know, understand and picture that. Um, but looking at the bigger picture, when I write, so obviously it's a bit different from my vocabulary novels because I'm making them, I'm almost making them what an editor would call purple, purple prose, which is I overuse prose. But that's to get the vocabulary in. But going back to, to what you said, Sheena, is I can't write anything unless I can see a picture in my head. And this is where we tie into comprehension kits and creative writing. So when I used to sit down with my children and do comprehension pieces, the first thing I said to them was, look at the title. That's going to give you a clue to what this is about. OK, um, you know, whether it's fiction, classic, blah, blah, blah. But I used to say to them, as you're reading it, build a picture up in your head. So if they're talking about a girl called Katie wearing a frilly dress, picture Katie with a frilly dress. If she's got freckles, picture her freckles, because it's much easier to remember pictures in your head and create a big picture than remember text but obviously yeah. there are other skills as well like underlining and things like this and annotating little things in in the in the margins and your tutors and Sheena can tell you more about that but to me it's all about a visual picture and I'm a very visual person and so when I write a scene I have to see it almost as a movie scene yeah and, and also what I do as well kids just in case I forget and you haven't got the benefit of doing this in a test. But whenever I have a character or a scene, I will find that character, often as an actor or an actress, and that will be the person in my head forever for the whole book. And I do the same with settings as well. So, so this setting actually here, I actually, I'm from Manchester and I base this on a museum that I used to go to in Manchester, well, that they used to take us to when, when we were kids. And I'll be honest, I was bored stiff, which is what <laughs> the kids are here in this passage. So to tie in with what Sheena says, picture it. But yeah. don't get confused with the hard words. Go for the, the, the large, tired, need. Yeah. And it's, it's not modern because it needs to be modern. That's right. That's right. So I hope that helps, Sheena. I think I'm glitching a little bit. I hope that helps, Sheena. I don't know if you want to move on. I don't want to take up too much time on that one. Are you glitching, Sheena? Right, okay. So it looks to me a little bit like Sheena has frozen. So I will continue to talk about, about this piece. Okay. Well, she's, back. she's back. Right. Okay, Sheena, I don't know if you want to take over there. I was talking about... Okay. I was just about to talk about elimination in multiple choice. But right. I don't yeah. Move. yeah, no, thank you, Sheena. Thank you for that. Um, so the main point there, which I was so happy that Sheena spoke about, was the idea of seeing the picture. Because when we are doing creative writing, of course, it's all about trying to convey what you've got in your mind, whether or not it's a continuation piece 
piece, whether or not it's um, a persuasive piece, you have to be able to picture and convey this idea, you know, really have it very clear in your mind. And so this idea of a comprehension, the first thing that we want to do is be able to see be able to see what's going on here. And we do that by using the words we already know and not zooming in on the words we don't know. Now, when the children get the gist of that, they do feel better about themselves. And we can have a real mental block with a comprehension that is tricky, that has these flooded with these kind of words in it. Um, but we just want to just say, don't worry about those, look at what you do know. And so if we move on down to just past the, per the first two lines, Ashina has summarized its uh, museum and pretty much we've got a general sense of what we're seeing there. Now, from about line three, we understand now that we want to see what the key idea is, the key idea. So as you're going through comprehension, and this links very much to write creative writing, you want to organize paragraphs in terms of what the key idea is. And we might be using something like a topic sentence, okay? Um, we might be using something like a topic sentence to introduce what we're going to be talking about in that paragraph. And so it's no different than when you're reading a passage. What one of the skills we have to do is find out, well, what's the key idea here? What's the main thing that's being spoken about? What's the main idea? And so if we look at from line three to four, line three to five, we can see hopefully what is the main idea. If anybody is out there and wants to just drop into the comments what they think the main idea is from about lines three to five, fire away, okay? And it's the word to... that's impossible to pronounce. <laughs> I, you, you can understand why I asked Sheena to read this. So if anybody else finds a hard time reading this, so you're not by your, you're not on your own. Okay, so at least we've got a bit of authenticity there. Okay, so yeah, so the main idea here, okay, as we, Sheena said, is in the topic sentence right at the beginning of that line three there. Okay, and of course it's then pointed back to repeatedly so that pronoun it's okay so when it goes on lay in a low-key glass case it's resting place for many years this innocent home for its dazzling supremacy so sometimes what i do with the children as well is they may get a little bit lost in terms of what is being referred to what is being spoken about and so sometimes on your 11 plus paper you might see question one who or what is Joe, for example? And it seems pretty straightforward. It seems, okay, yeah, this is what I'm thinking that I should be able to look into the passage and see and find out. Um, but what we want to do is just go back to the proper noun and then circle all the pronouns. And once we go back to the proper noun, we then circle all the pronouns and literally draw a line between the proper noun and the pronouns to see which ones match, who are they referring to. And this of course means rereading, re-looking at. So when we're doing comprehension, there's a method. And the method, unfortunately for the children, does mean looks, uh, does mean rereading, going back over. Because when you're studying a picture, which is really what you're doing, it's a picture by text. It's a picture of words. You have to give your brain enough opportunities to look at it and see it again so that you can absorb it and so that you can have that picture there. OK, so we're having here. Yes, um, I think Saba had said, is it a bracelet? What's the key idea? And then Hina said they think it looks worthless because it's not protected. So it looks like no one wants to take it. We, what are we saying, Sheena? They got yes. the key idea there? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to I'm going to pronounce that word again because it's a really strange one. So, guys, in the Welsh language, when you put the words C and H together, which makes ch in English, in Welsh, it's listen, wait for this. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> Gwalch gem. 
So yes, and in my book, I actually, Claire actually. Um, I'm not Claire even going to it. attempt it. In the book, Claire actually says to to Gladys, "Are you choking, Gladys?" Because she's never heard that word before. So you know, it's actually described as almost a choking sound. But but yes, um, Hina, you're absolutely right. Um, they're trying to make it look as though it's absolutely worth nothing. But but I really yeah. wanted to get this word in to the book, priceless, because every time I used to say yeah. to my kids, if they saw priceless in a text, it was one of those things where they'd home in immediately on the word less and think mm -hmm. priceless. It's worth nothing. Yeah. Yes. And it, I, I remembered it and I remembered it when I was writing the book. And this is one of those things that that tunes in again to reading before the word and after the word, Sheena, because because if you read after the word priceless, it, it actually answers the question. It tells you what priceless means. It's real value right. and power deliberately concealed. Um, yes. You know, so reading, like you say, forwards, backwards, to, to understand is, is absolutely key but yes it's the bracelet <laughs> well <laughs> yes it's the bracelet fantastic so I'm not even going to attempt to say the word at all. um yeah but the idea there of course is looking for the key words looking for the key how in terms of building our understanding how do we understand we want to just find out what the key idea is and that key idea might be a concept, it might be an event that's happening, it might be a person, we don't know. It depends on the text, it's going to vary, but we want to go back and look for the key idea, the main idea. And this will link directly to any writing you ever do because it is always structured about what is your main point, what is your key idea. In comprehension, you will be able to pick out your key idea because it's going to be repeated, it's the thing that's spoken mostly about. So for parents, when you're helping your children to find out, you know, to get to the notes, nuts and bolts of what's going on here, what is it about, what is each paragraph about, go to the key idea, what's the key idea, and then the children will be able to begin to build a picture, to be able to begin to build a picture. Okay, so there's a few things there in terms of... Um, skills that we need, basic skills to help us to see as we read through a text. And that skill is through any type of text, be it a narrative, a nonfiction piece, any type of text, it's the same kind of, um, it's the same kind of strategies you're going to use. So what I'm going to do now is we've got the rest of um, Sheena's um, comprehension here, the extract, and we're going to actually look at some of the questions that follow this. All right. Now, there are different types of questions when you are putting a paper together. And we don't really for 11 plus need to know what the types of questions are, but we certainly do need to know how to approach them. OK, how to approach them. All right. So let's scroll down a little bit. Let's just go to this. Scroll down a little bit. All right, and I'm going to st just stop sharing this a little bit and just show you the questions. Okay, sorry guys. Let's go into all my windows. Right, okay. Okay, I think I've skimped off the three so let me just go to my oh okay what I'll do is I'll go back to the first page because I believe the question is on the bottom of that first page all right so just bear with me a second all right so let's scroll down right okay can we all see question one Sheila, yeah. Yes. Before before we start, can yeah. we just can we just cover that critical thing that I asked you about when we were sort of talking privately? Because Sab has asked it here. Oh, the common, right. Yeah, the I've just seen question, it. Yeah, and okay. You know, going back to what I said about the the next comp, had I read the questions first, it would have helped me. 
Um, but I'd like to know what your thoughts as a tutor are on this. Right. And the question is, um, should parents ask their children to read the questions before yeah. actually reading the piece? Right. So I'm not speaking for all tutors. I'm speaking as um, my philosophy around teaching. OK, now I can see that most parents are saying, yes, read the question first. Um, that method works. So the, what I should say is the disclaimer is there isn't a rule, okay? So it's not, this is what you do. What happens is for children who are very able, who are very capable and can easily put together the main ideas in a text by scanning it, by looking at a text and just being able to quickly identify the concepts of a text and then from that just stringing together generally what's going on accurately for those children when they read the question first they're very it makes them very efficient they can read the question and then they have enough knowledge They've got enough knowledge to be able to build on that and understand accurately what's being conveyed in a text. That will work for those children. I have, however, had many children who feel that this is the method, so they don't read the text at all. They go to the questions and then they have misinterpreted the idea of the comprehension and will get those questions wrong. So for those children, I don't suggest that that's a method they should use. What I prefer them to be able to develop is quicker reading skills, to be able to read a passage quicker and make sense of it quicker. So over time for that skill to be developed, to read a bulk of information and to make sense from that information. Now that is a good skill to have. And that is a skill that will be very necessary if you're going on where you actually have to read complicated information and you have to glean the main ideas out of it and then do something with it. But sometimes our children are not at that point of skill yet. And so you have to, as a parent, you can be able to really judge your child's skill level and see which one works for your child. But as a tutor, I never teach that. I never teach it. And they hate it. They absolutely hate it. And the children, I'll emphasize, right, read the passage. I'm going to give you X amount of time for reading. You're certainly allowed that X amount of time in an exam. The time that you have to do the exam is really um, includes reading time. So read in See if you can read it within that time. See if you can read the text within three, four minutes. Yeah. Um, so that's what I encourage them to do. So it's not a flat out no, but it is only if it's appropriate for the academic ability of your child at that point, you know, at that point where they are then. But if they're not, there is no shame in going back through the text and reading it. And I know that there are some texts that I have to read a couple of times in order to to be able to say, oh, what did it say? Mm. And I'm an adult, you know, and I've read, yeah. So sometimes it's just for the children to be able to just scan that quickly and then get to the right answer is asking them to be able to have quite sophisticated skills consistently. Um, so yeah, so yes, yeah, Sabah, there's no right or wrong way, but definitely you'll have to, um, use that depending on the skill level of your child and if the children are getting a lot of questions wrong in comprehension it's not always because they have no clue what the passage is saying or they don't understand um, they don't understand the questions sometimes it's just that they've misinterpreted what they've read or perhaps they haven't read it so they they've, they've got a and especially where you have a passage where there are words in it that they do know they can misinterpret the meaning of the word, so how the word is used. So they'll scan a text and they'll see a word, I can't think of one now, and say, oh yeah, I know what that means, or I know that's a noun, or I know that's a verb, but it's been used in a different kind of way. And they won't see that if they haven't read the context, really, to get that context, okay? 
Uh-huh. All right, so um, I can see that there's some answers already to question one. All right, how could the museum be improved through refurbishment? And this kind of question, Sheena, they're right, right? <laughs> The answer's right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, um, so so this kind of question we'll call so there's different names for it, but it's, it's just simple retrieval, you know, um, direct comprehension. So you go into the passage. Um, you go into the passage. Oh, sorry. Um so you go into the passage and um you are able to see straight away from looking at the words. It's got the keywords there. And we use those skills where we just match the words that are in the question and we scan the text to see where those words are found in the passage. And when I'm doing the comprehension with the children and I'm teaching now a lot, as you can imagine, online, on Zoom, I will sometimes give them a text that I haven't sent to them beforehand. So it makes it quite unfair for them, but actually what I want to do is to see that they know where to look for the information. So we go to the questions and then I will um, scroll to the top of the text and I ask the children to tell me how to navigate down the screen, the screen to scroll up or to scroll down until they get to that point. Because what I'm asking them to do is to actually tell me where they are finding that information. And that's part of comprehension. It's knowing where to look for the information to be able to retrieve and find the answer to that. So here, the first one, very easy, straightforward, direct comprehension. Direct comprehension, and we can see modern refurbishment, or refurbishment is said in the question to, to give. So if we scroll down now again, and we're going to do the second question, which is at the bottom of this page, I believe. So it's good then. What does low key mean? What does low key mean? And again, really typical question here because low key is a type of expression and again this can sometimes stump the children because they're they're little cherubs they haven't heard every expression they haven't used every expression and sometimes i i genuinely feel quite sorry for them because it's sometimes that comes with time that just comes with talking and, and hearing having the chance having lived enough to be able to hear certain expressions and also it's worth noting that some of the classic texts used some outdated expressions, expressions we don't use anymore. So these kind of questions, of course, the more well-read you are or the more, um, if you've studied idioms or expressions, you might know a few of these. Um, but um, we're going to try to see if there's anything in the passage that gives us clues as to what that could mean. And I can see some of you already are saying, yeah, to D. And um, she's going to check if that's correct. <laughs> Low key. So we're going to, so D is cheap. So let's just go back up to the top. So what does low key mean? And we're going to go back to see where it's used. So it says line three. Now, whenever they say line three, we always know that we don't just read line three. We always read around it just to make sure that if there is anything else that can give us a clue, we remind ourselves of those clues, so those context clues, okay? Now, in this case, most of you, of course, who are pitching in know it's D, low key. So it says, well, actually, is it right, um, Sheena? So it's actually the, the right answer is modest. Right. Okay. Right. Because something could be low key, but be be cheap. Be cheap, but it could also be expensive. You know, you could you could wear. You know, my sister is fortunate enough to have a beautiful Gucci coat, which looks very low key, but it's actually very expensive. Yeah. In this context, and it's all about the context. Yes. It's modest. So modest right. it could be cheap, mm. but we know that it's modest. It could be low key, but it could be very expensive. And in actual fact, it looks low key, but what the reader doesn't know yet is that it's very, very, very magical. Right. So it's priceless. 
Yes. It's priceless. That comes later on in the book. So actually, guys, it's modest in this one. Right. And so let's just look to see. And so when we're doing multiple choice, there will always be a distractor there. There will always be words in there that they know children are going to reach for. Yes. They know that is quite familiar to them and oh yeah, it means cheap and it could, there is some tenuous links. It could mean that when it's used in a particular way. So if we were looking at this passage now to see whether or not there's anything there that tells us that it is cheap. Okay, what we hear, okay, so what we know is that actually the museum, if we go back to the top of the passage, the first two lines, we know that the museum needs some refurbishment and that it's quite tired. So it doesn't mean that the museum had all cheap fixtures, fixtures and fittings, but they were certainly needed updated, updating. And then when we come to line three, it, um, we hear that it's in its local glass case it's rest in place for many years this innocent home was a perfect disguise so of course yes that could trick us into thinking they've put it in somewhere shoddy to try to disguise people but what we understand is that it's rest in place for many years if they are deliberately trying as we read later on they're deliberately trying to make it not look as valuable as it is so the skills there is really to read back and to read forward and to really read around so that if low key isn't instantly obvious to us, we're going to try to build the picture to make that picture clearer of what it is that we can see. OK, and that will help us with any of the multiple choice um, 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 questions that are asked. What I always say as well is another thing that children can't stand doing is just checking, just checking back. Whenever you're doing multiple choice, very often the children are lulled in a false sense of, oh, multiple choice is easy because, you know, you've got a choice, you've got this percentage of getting one right, or I can just guess it. We don't want that. We don't want you to take an 11 plus exam on the fly and just be guessing as you go through. We want you to have a method to work it out. OK, we want to have to have a method to work it out. And those methods are just the basics of reading back, trying to see what's there, trying to see if you can find the clues that the author has put there for you. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just look at one more question from this piece before we move on to, an, well, perhaps two more that are kind of linked. All right, so I'm going to just stop sharing this and move on to another um, paper, okay. okay sorry. Okay. All right, I'll make this bigger, everybody. Okay, so we've already, Sheena, would you say, can everybody see question three, four, and five there? We all see? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so, um, when we've already, because we have very clearly looked at just the beginning of this extract for question one or two, by the time we get to question three, we're much clearer. We're in a much more confident place to see the answer. OK, good. So when we say, why was the glass case the perfect disguise for the, Sheena? Well, Gem. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you for that. We already know now, don't we? We already know. And so what happens is, so what is the answer, anyone? So number three, number okay. three, what's the answer? The answer. Okay. So I think Varsha had said C. And it's not C, is it? No. Ah. Because Varsha, actually, so if that's you there, um, we've just said, haven't we, that it's, if you look, it's look back at the text. It says dazzling supremacy. We don't actually mention cost of anything, and we actually say right. it's priceless. So yeah, it's D, Alice. Well done. Right, brilliant. Yeah. 
And so, uh, a, a user, it's quite interesting um, there, Sheena, because a user has just said that they're stuck between B and C. Right. And that, okay, so, so Facebook user, what I would do here is, now, now you've already read, you, you've read the passage, you've done questions one and two. I would actually eliminate, the gem was very shiny. I'd eliminate the gem was very expensive because we, we don't know whether it was expensive. We don't know whether it was shiny, but we do know it was priceless. So yes, but there's no mention of, of, of actual cost. So the gem is worth more than a gla the glass case because it's priceless. But the the real reason is is because it's an object of great power, and it actually does refer to its dazzling supremacy. In and it, I, I mean, I need to look back at the text exactly, but yeah, that is the, back to that. That's the the best answer. So if you actually look, and they will always put two really ambiguous yes, yes. Um, answers. Um, you know, I've just been reading Robert Lomax's books on comprehension because they're great because he explains everything and he says one of the, the one of the worst or the, the the trickiest things in multiple choices they'll give you two super yes. ambiguous questions yes rule out the ones that you know it's not and then go for the ones that give you evidence yes. and there is evidence that that it's actually not to do with cost but it's to do with power yes and so that idea of value and value doesn't have to be monetary and so this is the other idea. Oh, that my children would... are priceless, Sheena. <laughs> that's, right. that's right, you know. And so Although I might sell mine to the highest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> if mine on my internet again, then yeah, <laughs> the value goes down. But yes, the idea of how words are used is you it's really context It's really reading around and i know that we haven't read all of this passage so you guys are at a disadvantage um but it's really reading about the, around the passage to see what is the main idea that's being conveyed to us that idea of what is the main idea of the building blocks of not only your writing but understanding what the author is trying to get across okay and then of course they will use a word that they know you will make a link to in terms of its meaning and that's why it's there because it, multiple choice can seem very straightforward and easy not to pick up and very often year after year i hear the children go into um 11 plus exam halls and come out saying oh my goodness the english was easy the maths was really tricky and i always turn my nose up at that as an english teacher <laughs> and just say well you know because i know i see how many mistakes children make with the english and it's not because they don't understand the text it's perhaps because they've misinterpreted and then then they make little mistakes in the questions so they can come away feeling like i could read it and it was fine but actually still make a lot of errors with it okay so okay so we're moving on to question b now okay so question b and i've already got Sheila. there's some answers there um for, i mean question four and we're getting questions we're getting answers like B. Why was yes. the gem concealed in such an unassuming manner? Yes, it's it's absolutely B, and that's yes. so nobody would notice it was there. That's why it's in this shoddy museum. Yes, yes, and so that's pretty clear just from what we've read and discussed, and so on. Now, if we look at question five, and this will be the final one that we'll look at on this um, text, which word between line, lines? between lines one and 15 is the opposite of noticeable. Now, so this is a vocabulary question and sometimes it fills the children with dread because they think, oh my goodness, you know. And of course, to a certain degree, sometimes it's that vocabulary. You do need to know the meaning of some words in, in order to understand. But as Sheena had mentioned beforehand, when we're doing that multiple choice, we want to go through that method, the process of elimination. So you absolutely want to rule out the ones you know it can't be. And I guarantee you there'll be at least one word there that they think you know. These exams are designed for 10 year olds. There'll be a word there, they'll ease you into it. There'll be one word there that, that you'll know, and if not more, okay? And 
So if we're looking at which word between lines one and 15, and I'll go back to the extract so that you can have a good look at this, it's the opposite of noticeable. Now, they know who's put together. Well, Sheena knows that you know the word noticeable. That's quite a commonly used word, and we understand that it'll mean something that can be distinguished, we can see it, etc. And so it's looking for which word between the line ones and 15 is the opposite of noticeable. And I'm just gonna scroll up to one to 15, even though lots of people clearly have your book, Sheena, because they're um, <laughs> giving the answers. So we've got a variety of answers there, Sheena. You can look at those. Um, okay, and Alice is, Pointed oh. out, inconspicuous is if not in the text. If inconspicuous is not in the text, Alice, then we need we need to make we need to change that. Then that's an error. But um, yeah, the answer is inconspicuous. Well, oh, okay, Let's have that's a fine. That. Okay, but, uh, that, that's yeah. an error then if it's not in the text. So the other thing about that, I'm going to make a point about errors. I'm going to make a point about errors. So let's look at 1 to 15. It, 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 is, oh, in the, it, it is in the text, text. yes. Yeah. So at line 15, 14, 13, tucked away in an inconspicuous part of town. Inconspicuous part of town. So it's there. Okay. All right. Okay. And, and so I think we, the, clue, the clue to that is tucked away, isn't it? Yes. Yes, you know yeah. it's tucked away. So, so there is your absolute clue. Um, yes. and again, it's yeah. reading before, reading and after. Humble, tucked away. Yeah, there's there's your answer. Yeah, and it tells you. So, what I do with the children sometimes is that if they don't know the meaning of that word of, of vocabulary, I actually cross it out in the text. I say to them, right, just cross out that word. What is the sentence telling you? Just from the words in the sentence that you already know. OK, and if they when they then read it, they actually hear the words that are there because their brain isn't just zooming in on the what they don't know. All right. Yeah. So comprehension is understanding that you've got knowledge. And I always say to the children, you're an English expert. You can do this. You've actually got a lot of knowledge. You just don't know you have it. You know, so it's just really unlocking for them that they can see a picture. They can paint a picture and they can do that from the words they already know. OK. All right. So we're going to move on now. Actually, I wanted to make one point, which is nothing to do with comprehension or creative writing, but it is to do with an 11 plus test and um, coming up with errors. So I know that there wasn't an error in this text here, okay? But sometimes we think there is if we haven't read it carefully, you know? So if we haven't read a text properly, then you might think something is there that isn't or vice versa. But the other thing is that part of doing the preparation for the children and doing test papers or working through this is that sometimes there will be typos in material. And unfortunately, even in the most plans, you can get to GCSE level and have a paper in front of you with an error in it. And so part of the preparation is for the children not to lose their cool under circumstances like that, but to think logically about what I do and certainly not to stop working, but to just have a process just, okay, so what am I going to do here? So if it is, if that word wasn't even in the text, can I rule out the others? Could I say to myself, well, okay, you know, what, what can I do? So we don't want children to just freeze if there's an error. The year that my youngest son did the test, um, there was an error on the paper in the way that the um, questions had been printed out on the paper, which muddled up the A, B and C, D and so on. And that threw some children. You know, it was quite controversial. Uh, they certainly didn't run the test over. But the idea is that errors can happen both on the material that you're using, um, both on the material on the day, hopefully not. But if these things do happen, let's just move forward. Um, you can always put your hand up to say something to somebody, but keep on moving through the paper. Don't freeze and don't stop there and try and think about it. Okay. All right, so let's move on now to another text, okay? So we're gonna go to um, the Highgate paper. All right, so let's just stop sharing that one. Um, yes, okay. Okay, now. It's a few little clicks to get it up on the screen, so please bear with me. Okay. 
So um, again, this paper is accessible on Highgate School Past Papers. Um, and we are going to read a little bit of the text and look at just a few of the questions, not all of them. Now, the reason I have put up a standard form um, passage as well is because I just want to show you a variety of different types of question types. Okay, all right. Um, and then after this, we'll go back to a not we'll go back to a nonfiction piece. So, all right. So we're going to look first. We're going to look at the type of questions because I just want to show you the type of questions we're looking at. So we're going to look at question three. What are the men's faces compared to? Okay, so that we can find that. And then we're going to look at question four. Choose two words from this descriptive sentence. Explain what effect they create. So we're going to look at how to answer that type of question. And perhaps five and six and possibly seven. We'll see how quickly we get through that because time. Well, my goodness, we've been on for nearly an hour. Right, okay. All right, so let's um, swiftly move through this. Right, okay, so let me just scroll up to the passage. Okay, and I'm going to make it slightly bigger so that it's easier for everybody to see. Is that good? Can we read it at that width? Yeah, is that clear for everyone? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right, so a typical independent school type of paper, okay, and it's nicely laid out. This one has the paragraphs numbered for you. No doubt you're going to get asked about a question in a particular paragraph. And it always gives you that little preamble at the beginning. The first thing I say to, and to the students is always read that background information. Always read it because it tells you about the setting. It gives you some clues about what the piece is about. Very often the children will just go to the first paragraph and they just start reading the extract straight away and yet there might be answers here. Okay, so always encourage them that when you get a piece of paper in front of you, you read from everything on that sheet. Everything. We don't, we're not going to miss anything out. And certainly anything that is in bold font is saying Look at me, pay attention to what I've got to say to you. So we start looking and we understand that Jack's an American author and journalist, and it tells you when it was set, which is important. Okay, set in the 1890s in Alaska. So if we know anything about Alaska, we know that it's a pretty cold place. I've never been there, but that's all I know about it. And it's a story of a sled dog and the people with whom he works. It's the story of a sled dog and the people with whom he works. Now, just from that introduction, we understand that the main character in this extract is going to be, instead of a who, oh, well, okay, kind of who, who, but it's a dog, okay? It's a dog. So it's not our usual human character. And so therefore, the story, the narrative might be through the eyes of this animal. It might be through the eyes. And so that context just tells us, it gives us quite a lot of information, all right? Okay, so if we read down a little bit, Sheena, can you read, I think you've got a really lovely reading voice. Um, so yeah. yeah, so if we yeah. read the first, let me just see the first. Yes, yeah, so I want, could you read, up to the third paragraph, please. Up to and including, or just up to? Yeah, I mean, uh, and including, sorry, okay. and including. Okay. Down the frozen waterway toiled a string of wolfish dogs. Their bristly fur was rhymed with frost. Their breath froze in the air as it left their mouths, spouting forth in spumes of vapour that settled upon the hair of their bodies and formed into crystals of frost. Leather harness was on the dogs, and leather traces attached them to a sled which dragged along behind. The sled was without runners. It was made of stout birch bark and its full surface rested on the snow. The front end of the sled was turned up like a scroll in order to force down the soft snow that surged like a wave before it. On the sled, securely lashed, was a long and narrow oblong box. There were other things on the sled blankets, an axe and a coffee pot and frying pan, but prominent 
occupying most of the space was the long and narrow oblong box. At front and rear toiled two men. Their bodies were covered with fur and soft tanned leather. Eyelashes and cheeks and lips were so coated with the crystals from their frozen breath that their faces were not discernible. This gave them the seeming of ghostly masks, undertakers in a spectral world at the funeral of some ghost. But under it all, they were men, penetrating the land of desolation and silence. Oh, thank you, Sheena. You really have got that author's flair. It just makes <laughs> me want to read the rest of it. Okay, good. Right. So really, the writer has used a lot of imagery here. So when you are doing your creative writing and your teachers will be showing you all about your uh, language device, your literary devices, the kind of things, a lot of acronyms that we use for them, MAPA, the A Forest, lots of different acronyms to help you to remember the kind of tools that you must use with your writing. So sometimes one of the ways that we can re do revision with a comprehension text is to go through and ask the children to pick out or to identify features, to identify language features, and they underline and they go through and they're able to pick out this feature. I guarantee you that this kind of question, and it does, will ask you to identify a comparison of some sort, be it a simile or a metaphor or something, okay? So we're gonna waste no time and just scroll down to question three, which I believe is on this, yes, it's on this sheet. So we're going to scroll down to question three. And it says, what are the men's faces compared to in paragraph three? And we're just going to say out the sentence. So you can so, um, type out the sentence in the, comment, in the comment section. What are the men's faces compared to in paragraph three? And then what we're going to do is because three and four are linked, it's asking you to pick out two words from that sentence and explain the effect they create. And we're going to speak through that. So first of all, question three, what are the men's, men's faces compared to in paragraph three? So find that sentence first. So perhaps we'll scroll up to it. And then you're going to pick two words from that sentence and explain the effect they create. And this is where we're going to ask Sheena to just make sure we're on the right track in terms of the impact that it's making on the reader, because this is what the writer wants to happen to occur. So what are the men's faces compared to in paragraph three? So let's go back up to paragraph three. And there you go. So anybody with an idea is going to pick out that sentence. What are their faces compared to in paragraph three? OK, Sheena, you can pick out those answers there. I can see Alice. Yeah, so Alice is correct. They're, they're compared to undertakers. Um, right. They're also they're compared to ghosts. Right. Um, right, yeah. And there, there's something else as well that um, I just wanted to mention about this text. And I had to look up the word rhyme um, mm -hmm. to see what rhyme was, because obviously you can you can discern it from mm -hmm. from from the descriptions, you know. But I've never seen the word rhyme, and it's basically mm -hmm. small ice crystals that are formed right. from vapor. Um, mm -hmm. So, but but yeah, the kids don't need to know that, and that's the whole point that we're trying to make. Yeah, that yeah, they don't know it yet, and no. yeah, undertakers, ghosts, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. So now we're in that sentence. Question four leads on, and very much when you're doing these um, um, questions, these papers, you'll find that sentences can, once you know the answer to one, it helps you to answer another question. Not every single one, but there will be questions that are linked to each other, even if they're numbered separately. So and that question four, yeah. Sheena, just to mention, you know, it says choose two words from this descriptive sentence and explain what effect they create. Yes. There is there is there is not going to be two kids will have a different interpretation. So yes. long as they're getting the actual gist that it makes them almost look dead. You yes. know, they, they, look, <laughs> they, look, they look dead. They yes. look like ghosts. They look like people that are haunting. That's so, right. So kids, it, you know, it doesn't have to be an exact answer there, so long as you're getting the gist. And yes. undertakers, very dead people. Yeah, you know? yeah. So they look yeah. dead. That's right. Okay. And so, exactly. So Sheena's helped to answer it for us, which is fantastic. So that idea where you have to 
to see this. Okay, and there is enough words there, and there is a lot of description around the setting here, around the environment that they hinted or they told us at the very beginning, before the extract started, that they're in this very cold, desolate place. Okay, um, it talks about, like she just said, what they rhymed with. The front front end was turned up. Let me see. The bodies were covered with fur and soft hand leather, eyelashes and cheeks were so coated with the crystals from their frozen breath. And so even if we didn't know anything more, we can see that. That's something that we can relate to. And so an author will put that in because they know we can relate to that. We understand what that experience is like. And so when we are writing, and certainly when an author is putting together, constructing this piece, they will put in bits and pieces of experiences that we experience as, as people. So we connect, we understand what it means to be frozen, even though we may never have been on a sled in this part of Alaska before. We might not know the depth to, the, to which they are experiencing the cold, but certainly when it uses words like frozen breath, we can really relate to, my goodness, it must be intensely cold, okay? So it's being able to see this, this is what the comprehension is. And so when we're talking about what is the effect, the effect is, I always says, I think Alice has said, what do you think about that? I think she, that's very good. But yeah. it, and, and Alice, that's really good because basically that's your interpretation and it's great. It's right. It's the way you read it. It's this is like why I always say to people, read the book before you see the film, because yes. the film tells you what you're supposed to be seeing, whereas yeah. a book allows you to experience it in your own mind. So but yeah, yeah. well done, Alice. Yeah, the whole yeah. thing, yeah. Is, the whole thing is grim. You know, he's trying to say this is very grim and it's cold. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, of yeah, course, well exactly, Sheena, when that advice to read the book, because when you read the book, the picture, it's like a set of still shots, still scenes in your mind and the imprint that it makes. And so sometimes when you see the film, you go, oh, my goodness, but they've left out this and they've left out this crucial idea and they've changed this character and so on. And of course, they have to condense it for the sake of being a, a movie. But the, the, the picture, the words you read are all about a writer painting a picture with words. And so yeah. when we're going back to comprehension, that is the skill that you're reminding the children that they want to decode this. They want to, if you could paint that paragraph, what would your picture look like? And what the children will automatically go to is they'll just pick out the main key things that it has connected with them. OK, and then you can fill the gaps as you go along. OK, so OK, so when we look at question four, so let's just go into question four now. We think we've answered that. What effect they create. So this word effect. So effect always, I say to the children, as soon as you hear the word effect or you read that word effect, it really is just another word for saying what impact, what's the reaction, what's happening to you when you read that? What's happening to you? So when you read that passage, what do you see? Now, if that description included details about a smell, you would begin to say, the reader can smell, I don't know, you know, the wafting of the, I don't know, lovely baked cake or something, okay? This picture here is about a feeling. Because they're talking about the idea of ghostly and frozen, we understand it's cold. And so what we want to be saying is that the reader something, you know, understands that they, the, the characters are in a deathly cold environment, something like that, anything to meet to that effect. And like Sheena said before. So what we want to use in our responses to those is some senses words. What does the writer feel? What does the writer see? Does it help us to hear something? And so anytime we see that word effect, 
I always say to the children, effect just means one of these senses. Which one is this description connecting to the most? Is it a sound that is being described? Is it just a sensation? Is it just a mental feeling? What is it? What sense are we connecting to? And once they identify the sense, then we just show them, well, how to write up, write it up in a formulaic way that that responds. OK, and there's a structure to that. Yes. It makes us feel cold. Um, yeah, so in Sapa, yes, just to, to just re-emphasize, picturing the narrative will help the child understand even new words. Absolutely. That is comprehension. Comprehension is reading and seeing it. What do you see? And so parents, when you're helping your children at home, this is what you, you want to be asking them. What, what can we picture here? OK, what helps us to see that picture? OK, ignore that word we don't know. But let's just move on to what we do know. What picture does it show us? And that helps us to see things. We all understand things better, the better, the clearer it is in our minds. So that's the comprehension. OK, I'm really um, conscious of time. OK, I think the five is pretty much the same as four. So I'm going to go to question six. It's asking to use your own words and describe the mood or atmosphere in the wilderness. The mood or atmosphere in the wilderness. And we've touched on it already, of course, because now we have a very clear picture of where these characters are, of the setting it is. OK, you describe the mood or atmosphere in the wilderness, paragraph five. And I'm going to skim up to paragraph five. And we're going to use our key words to pick out paragraph five. So can we all see that? So an hour went by and a second hour. The pale light of the short sunless day was beginning to fade when a faint far cry arose on the still air. It soared upward with a swift rush till it reached its topmost note, where it persisted, palpitant and tense, and then slowly died away. It might have been a lost soul wailing, had it not been full of a sad fierceness and hunger. The front man turned his head until his eyes met the eyes of the man behind. And then, across the narrow oblong box, each nodded to the other. Right. So the question again, so we've read it, very full of depth of feeling there. And the question is, describe the mood or atmosphere in the wilderness. Describe the mood or atmosphere in the wilderness. Describe the mood and atmosphere of, in the wilderness, mood or atmosphere in the wilderness. So what kind of things, if anybody's got any ideas, the atmosphere, Sheena, do you want to look at that? What do you think? Yeah, so right. I'm just I'm just actually writing a few things down here. So I've I've put and I, I'm I'm not I'm just going to put them as words. Yeah, so that yeah. We're wasting much yeah. time. I've put hostile, dangerous, lonely, mm. empty, predatory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, those are the those are the feelings that I'm getting from yes. that specific sentence. Uh, yeah. Paragraph rather. Yeah. Um, because I think you really do have to read between the lines. There. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's basically, it, it's going dark. And there's really nothing there except the cry of this. That's right. Thing. And from here, we don't actually know what this thing is yet. No, we um, don't. We so, don't. So yeah. um, I would say, yeah, hostile, dangerous, lonely, empty, predatory, scary, terrifying to me. Yes. Because I don't know what that yeah. is yet. Yeah, so, and there's yeah, a lot. Somebody's somebody's written eerie, haunted, freezing. Yeah, yeah, well yeah. Done. yeah. Abandoned, <laughs> somber, fear. Yeah. yeah. So all of these feelings. So in order to answer this question, we do not have to be reliant on using complicated or ambitious eleven plus vocabulary. It's okay for us to say and use our simple language say, as children, as long as it's accurate, as long as you're getting the gist of the feeling that's being conveyed here through the imagery, through the description, okay? So we don't, it's 11 plus paper, but we don't want to think that we can't, sometimes we don't express ourselves clearly enough because we think our words aren't good enough. 
And we think that we always have to use a really um, ambitious word to express something when actually we want what's most important is that it's clearly said. OK, so it's clearly said and that will link to not just your responses in an 11 plus comprehension question, but certainly when you're doing your creative writing, that the main emphasis in your piece of writing is that you want to make sure that your writing is relevant, but that it's clear, it can be read and it makes it more effective. And I know, Sheena, we were speaking about some of the pitfalls when mm. you see creative writing and perhaps you want sure. to just say something about that. Yeah, actually, um, and again, I'm very aware of the time, but um, yeah. there's, there's, first of all, I want to caveat this with the standard of the creative writing I see from these kids is phenomenal and it, it, in my creative writing group I almost feel bad giving the kids tips because it, it sort of looks like criticism when it's not it's just little room for improvement but I'd say the, the biggest pitfall I see is people not respecting adjectives and pouring too many in and and so they, they'll use too many literary devices in a short period of time and everything falls over itself and it detracts us from the piece. And I know that kids are trying to show off their best, you know, their best face for the test. But I think when they're practicing at home, you know, you only need one adjective really, because if you upgrade your verb and you upgrade your nouns, so instead of calling a boat a boat, call it a yacht, call it a steamer, call it an oil tanker, um, you know, don't run, sprint, bolt, belt. If you, if you take away all the adjectives and upgrade everything else and keep it true and keep it clear, so, so think about your metaphors. Are they real or are they a bit mixed? Similes, are they real? You know, keep it real, keep it simple and don't lose the essence of the story. You know, uh, this is not my quote, I read it in a group, but writing for the 11 plus, you're better off writing a lot about a little as opposed to a little about a lot but keep it keep it true so read something and think am I just trying to show off too much there or does it make sense and I think if you feel you're trying to show off a bit too much <laughs> wear it back and keep it simple because yeah. sometimes less is more um Absolutely. and that that's that that would be my key takeaway so um, it's and also at primary school we are told a lot to use adverbs. Um, Stephen King, who's a pretty you know well known author, mm -hmm. has said that the road to hell is paved with adverbs. <laughs> and what he means by that is, people that use adverbs tend to say he ran quickly. So you don't need to say that. You can just say he sprinted, because you don't need quickly and. If you can take superfluous words out of your writing, yeah. take them out, I would say only use one or two adverbs in your whole piece of 11 plus writing. You don't need them if you're using the correct verbs. So the road to hell is paid with <laughs> adverbs. And I, when I actually write my book, Sheena, at the end, I do a search on LY. Right. And wherever I've overused adverbs, they go. Upgrade, right. your nouns, upgrade your nouns. Fantastic. One adjective, two at the most. And I would say only one adjective per sentence. But, you per know, sentence. yeah, well, yeah, I don't mean in the whole piece. Yeah. But in your, in your ad, in adverbs, I would say only two in your in your whole piece. And kids, yeah. we don't need myriad excla exclamation marks either. <laughs> um, again, you don't need them, use one. And also, kids, what another mistake I see all the time is ellipses. You only ever use three, ever, 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 ever. Never yeah. four, never two. And there should be a space before and a space after. So, because I see Americans don't put a space before, but British style should have a space before and space after. Anyway, so. Right, yeah, perfect um, advice. I'm just going through because I think we've really run out of time. But we have looked at this idea of the main ideas we wanted to get across is when we are comprehending what do we have to do. And comprehension 
is really just about looking at a text and, oops, sorry. So looking at a text and trying to see what it is saying, all right? So looking at a text and trying to see what it is saying um, and how we do that, of course, is by going through and looking at the keywords, okay? So the keywords um, and looking at what clues are in the text that show us detail about the image or about the idea, okay? All right, so we want to start from that and go slowly. Break up your text, break up the reading into smaller chunks and ask your child to show you to explain what it is they see, okay? So what it is they see. All right, when we do that, we are looking at, we're going back to our basis about keywords, context clues, topic sentences. We're doing all of these comprehension um, strategies and magic words that help us to see the text. When we see the text, even though we spend more time in the reading and trying to see it clearly, that is what makes us if more efficient answering the questions because we've, we've got the picture laid out there. OK, do not focus in on the words you don't know. Like Sheena was just saying, in the same way that you shouldn't add in too much and you can take those out and then your writing is more effective. When you read a comprehension of words you don't know, take them out and say what you can see. And that helps you to get to meaning. Sheena, okay? I just want, yeah. is it OK if I just address a quick question here? Yes, please. Yes, yeah. Alice, Alice Chang, you say how many adjectives will be sufficient enough for a paragraph? Alice, try not to think of it in that way, OK? Be an honest writer. So instead of saying um, the, the tall, hairy, toothless, brown-skinned, yellow-toothed man, just, <laughs> just, just in, in that sentence, give him maybe one or two adjectives, but slip more detail in him about, about him later on. So you're not hitting the reader over the head. So what I try and do is I'll, I, I put hints instead of giving lists like of descriptions. So he had, he had blue eyes, blonde hair, nice teeth. Unless you've got to get that in quickly, try and slip it in somewhere else. But I wouldn't count, just try and keep it true. Yeah. And the only reason yeah. I did mention a word count on adverbs is because there's a better way of, of using them. You don't need them if you upgrade your verbs. So you can have tons and tons of great verbs, but adjectives are just superfluous if you're using great verbs. I hope yeah. that makes sense. Yes, um, it does. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And thanks, Barbara. I hope I'm not too candid with my feet. <laughs> <laughs> there is so much more really this when we were asked to do this there is so much because there's so much that we could have said and we've run out of time now um but um yes i'm just glad for the questions put yeah. them in the chat and yeah. we'll, I'll, I'll get back to them because she yeah. has done most of the work here so I'll, oh. I'll get back if you've got any more questions for me stick them in the chat and i'll answer yeah them yeah yeah but keywords there, it's just the key ideas is really the comprehension, break it down. And just like when you have a task in life generally, we break it down into small steps of understanding and you tackle that, what can we see there? What can we see? And don't be frightened. So sometimes we know that when the children, especially when they get to year five, we don't wanna handhold them too much at this point because they should be working independently now, but it's okay to clarify something that you read to just help to sh to show them the picture to say oh well this is what i see what do you see and to give them a nudge like that rather than helping them to answer the the paper the question okay sheena yeah cool all um, done now yeah and thanks again to saba for hosting us here in the group and thank you sheena yes, thank you, you so much you you did the slides and and the donkey work oh no so. we've worked together it's been fabulous so hopefully we'll have another opportunity to have a dynamic duo again yeah, <laughs> but thank you everybody good. and i hope you've really found it useful and like we said any questions put them in the chat and we'll respond to them as soon as we can thank you everybody and goodbye enjoy the rest of your weekend bye bye bye